Hey everybody, this is Aubrey Chavez from Faith Matters. Dacher Keltner is a scientist who's been studying happiness and well-being for decades. He writes that he's taught happiness to hundreds of thousands of people around the world, and that 20 years into teaching happiness, he's found an answer to how to live the good life. Find awe. To that end, he's written a new book called Awe, The New Science of Everyday Wonder and How It Can Transform Your Life. The book was not only moving and fascinating and thoroughly researched, it also raised a lot of really important questions for us. Among the most important was what implications his research on awe has for religious people. It seems like what Latter-day Saints call feeling the spirit has a strong connection to what Dacker refers to as awe, and we were able to ask him about that. While he's not a traditionally religious person himself, his exploration of awe has led him to believe that there is a realm of understanding and human experience that is beyond scientific explanation. And on a really practical level, Dacker's book and the conversation with him helped us to understand how we can integrate awe into our everyday lives and illustrated the astounding benefits that an awe practice can have for each of us. Dacker received his PhD from Stanford University in 1989 before joining Berkeley's psychology department in 1996, where he's been ever since. Over 500,000 people have enrolled in Dacker's edX course, The Science of Happiness, and then he also hosts the podcast, The Science of Happiness, that if you haven't heard, you should definitely check out. All right, really hope that you enjoy this conversation with Dacker Keltner. With that, we'll jump right in. All right, well, Dacker Keltner, welcome, and thank you so much for being here. We are so interested in the things that you are interested in, and you've had such a fascinating career, and um, we just have so much respect for the work that you're doing and for you, so welcome and thank you. Thank you, Aubrey, and it's great to be with you guys, Kim. Too. You too. Yeah, thanks. So um, you've been studying happiness for decades yeah. and are one of the world's leading emotion scientists. With And I know you've done research on compassion, specifically in beauty yeah. and love, but you write in this newest book that 20 years in, you have found an answer to the perennial question, how to live the good life. So mm -hmm. a life that is genuinely good, that is you know joyful and connected and full of meaning and and very simply, it's just, it's to find awe. Yeah. And so, and I, I feel like immediately my biggest question was like, this, this is a word, this word awe, I think yeah. for a lot of us is really a placeholder for when we have experiences that are beyond words. Like we really can't describe it. And so we call it awe. And so it seems so overwhelming that you could actually, <laughs> you could actually define it so clearly as to even put it into a, a lab and observe it and measure it. And so I wonder if you could just talk about that process and how you, how you even start studying something that is so elusive? Yeah. What a terrific question, Aubrey. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting because um, uh, awe is, like you said, it's this experience that's beyond words, right? We historically, people have written about it in terms of being a spiritual emotion, right? Which I suspect a lot of our listeners have felt. Uh, an emotion that is what we feel in relationship to nature or music, uh, music, you know, our, our experience is a musical awe, music resists description. And then the feeling that we have is so beyond words. Uh, but, and I think that that's part of the reason that science really hadn't tackled awe, you know, until our lab came along 10, 15 years ago. And so what we do as scientists is a couple of things, which is we define it. Uh, we, and what I relied on uh, as I report on in the book, is a lot of spiritual uh, experiences that people wrote about, like William James and beyond, you know, Julian of Norwich in England in, the, I think, the 15th century. I relied on a, a lot of descriptions of the experience of transcendence in nature. Uh, and I arrived at a definition, also consulting philosophical traditions, Edmund Burke, for example, awe is an emotion that you feel when you encounter vast things that are mysterious right? Divinity is mysterious. Nature is mysterious. Life is mysterious. Music is, is mysterious and vast. And that gets us a long way in starting the scientific inquiry into awe, which is let's go study things that really are beyond our frame of reference and that the human mind doesn't immediately understand. And that's where we started. Yeah. Could you maybe give a little bit more insight <clears throat> into sort of your uh, research methodology. I'm super yeah. curious. Once you, you know, sort of once you have the thesis and a desire to study this, are you running controlled experiments? Is this mostly qualitative, observational? Like how do you how do you actually go about it? Yeah. Thank you, Tim. And your question just gave me goosebumps because oh. <laughs> uh I appreciate uh, you know, your your sort of hunger to know like how would we study this with the tools of science. Yeah. Um, you know, the the science of emotion that I'm part of 
what I really love about it is that, and, and I report on this in the book, is that we use every methodology. And, you know, to understand what awe is for a human being and for society and for our culture, you know, we can gather self-report measures. How much awe do you feel? I can measure, measure human physiology, like the goosebump reaction is something that's measurable, right? You can, and that's a muscular contraction around hair follicles that correlates with awe. I can look at a neuropeptide, a chemical in our body like oxytocin. My lab specializes in the vagus nerve, which is the, a big bundle of nerves that wanders through your, your body below your brainstem that controls the covariation or correlation between respiration, breathing, and heart rate. Um, and we can put all of that package together. And what I can tell you is when people feel awe, they, it's about these vast, mysterious things. They can tell you that it's different from beauty. Uh, it affects their goosebumps, their tears, the lump in the throat, the vagus nerve. It activates certain, deactivates certain regions of the brain. But here's what's really interesting, Kim. And, you know, uh, studying, relying on this kinds of scientific measures, I, you know, as I started to write this book, I was like, you know, and this relates to Aubrey's observation earlier, like, I still don't know what the essence of awe is, you know, even though we have these measures. And so what we did in the lab, and it really runs throughout the book, is get people's stories of awe. Ask people, we've asked people from 30 different cultures, like, tell us about a time when you encountered something vast and mysterious and you felt this emotion of awe. China, India, Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, US, New Zealand. And those stories, I think, really get to the kind of core meaning of awe. Uh, and it is more qualitative, like you said, Tim, like, yeah. you know, people talking about the birth of a child or seeing these vast trees or having a spiritual experience or listening to music in a candlelit uh, monastery and just starting to weep. And, and that starts to get to like, this is the story of the emotion that is part of our human being. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious if there's in, in English in 2023, if there's a synonym for awe or, is, you know, is it wonder, is it yeah. mystery or is it, is awe the only word that truly encapsulates everything about it? Yeah. You know, and, and this is what's tricky about relying on words, you know, is that they, how do we capture? Yeah. How do we capture, right? You know, this thing like, wow, I'm encountering something that's vast and mysterious. Like, you know, I, when my brother passed away and he was a very important figure in this book, there was one time where I, I literally, after he had passed, I felt his hand on my back, right? And it was vast and mysterious. I got these tears. I, how would we ever, you know, make sense of that? Um, and so, you know, um, what we do is we put the whole package together of these measures. Um, and we try to understand its, its meaning for a person at a particular moment in time. Yeah. I was curious, you mentioned your brother, and that was such a beautiful anchoring story throughout the whole book. Mm -hmm. But you. I wondered if after all of the, everything you've learned in a lab, when you had this really acute experience with awe, with the passing of your brother, did it bring anything into focus? Like, did it make, did it make awe more important to you in a way that you hadn't quite grasped yet in the laboratory? Aubrey, what a fundamental question. You know, um, I've studied awe uh, for 15, 20 years as a scientist. I've read 3,000 stories of awe from around the world. I've read almost everything that was written related to it, from spiritual journaling to nature experiences. Um, and then I had um, this transcendent experience of, you know, my really one of the closest people in my life. My brother, younger brother, Rolf, passed away one year younger than me. He was just part of my life narrative. And then following the transformation of my life in grief, where awe was such a prominent part of it. Like, how do we make sense of the passing of an individual? And, and the writing of this book, the science, the grief taught me a couple of things. Um, one is, um, I really came to believe that awe is a, yeah. A lot of contemplative people are very interested in the kind of the basic states of consciousness. Maybe compassion is a basic state of consciousness. That's what His Holiness the Dalai Lama would say. Uh, and I really came to believe that life is about wonder and awe. 
you know, to your synonyms, Kim, like wonder, awe, curiosity, mystery, all of those yeah. uh, come together. I just feel like at any moment in time, we can access this basic state, you know, that I'm talking to you two individuals who are we're using language to speak to a community about this amazing experience. That's awesome, right? And the second thing that was interesting for me personally, um, and this came out of grief and then the, the scholarship on Oz, I became much more open to transcendence of what the mind doesn't understand, you know, and mystery. Uh, I, there were so many, and, and transforming my feelings about life and afterlife and consciousness that you know, we just understand a small sliver of human experience. There's all this mm -hmm. supernatural, spiritual, these dimensions to our lives that I became open to with awe. And so now almost every day I feel it robustly. It, it still is this mystery that pushes me forward. And, and I think, you know, part of my hope in writing the book is all of us should be in this inquiry that all leads us to of what does it really mean to us to be alive? Yeah. I, I wanted to ask you about that, actually, because just this morning I was I was listening to your meditation on impermanence from your podcast. Yeah. And and I noticed myself really I felt like I was sort of oscillating between anxiety and awe because yeah. because of that mystery. Yeah. factor. And it, it just made me wonder, you know, if mystery is always part of the context of awe, yeah. then are we always going to be choosing between these anxious, fearful feelings of that they always or that can always accompany uncertainty and and just like just enjoying the the mystery and wonder and and so i i wonder like to what extent are we really capable of choosing awe because maybe we always will have the choice between fear and these these beautiful feelings and is it something that we can nourish and get better at what a god what a spectacular question right you know we know uh etymologically the origin of the word awe it's intermingling with fear and dread because awe we often fear feel around horrifying things, life and death issues and the like. Um, awe is very close subjectively to fear. Um, and about a quarter of awe experiences do have the sense of threat, peril, and fear. And I think you, you put it really well, Aubrey. And, I, and this could be a next book, which is in many ways, life is a choice about choosing awe over fear, right? The embracing mystery, embracing uncertainty, embracing that we don't know that things are impermanent. That's a fundamental truth about life that all the great spiritual traditions grapple with. And we know, you know, if you look at where we find awe in music and in spirituality and in the moral beauty of people and in, in visual art, life and death issues, big ideas, right? There's always this, this tension between is it awesome and uplifting and exhilarating or anxiety producing and alienating? And I think that's in some sense, the human choice is to say, like when my brother passed away, um, when he was dying of colon cancer, I was blown off the map. And I was like, I was trying to use my scientific mind to like figure it all out. I read every paper, I knew the statistics. Oh, I'll figure this out. No, I'm not gonna figure it out, right? I had to embrace the mystery. And the minute I did that, suddenly the whole process of this end of life became fulfilled with sacred moments, right? That is what the end of life is. So I think you, I think you should write the book, Aubrey, which is like, <laughs> choose awe because fear okay. is, fear's okay, yeah. but, but there, but we gravitate to mystery to, to find the deeper meanings in that tension of awe yeah. and fear. Yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, with Susan Cain's work, but she, yes. so she has this book, Bittersweet, that was released yeah. in the last, in the last year or two. And there were so many echoes of that book. I felt like um, when we were learning more about awe, yeah. especially along these lines, because I think one of the arguments that she sort of makes is that these really vast emotions are so like, they're so big that they almost have to encompass all sides of things. You know, there has to yeah. be bitter and sweet for something so transcendental. Yeah. You know? And I feel like yeah. that's a, that's a huge part of awe as well. And you, like you mentioned throughout the book, like um, different ways of different ways of experiencing awe and we should get into all of those yeah um, but that are sort of like that are j j positive you know but yeah. like some of these biggest moments of awe they have that element of both the bitter and the sweet yeah and you know aubrey put it really nicely there's you know when i wrote this book i kept coming back to a couple of words that i didn't hadn't thought about in my scientific career 
one was wandering. We have to allow ourselves to wander to find truth. But the other was mystery, you know, and the, the great truths of life are mysterious, you know, um, and awe is animated by mystery. Like you're saying, Tim, it just like mystery drives us forward. You know, how do I understand this emotion? How do I understand whom I love? How do I understand the divine? All, you know, our, these are the big questions. Our mind will get anxious initially, but if we rely on awe, we arrive at, at progress in understanding. <laughs> I'm curious how you how you think our uh, our engagement with awe has changed in in this information age. I I was thinking about our kids and how you know yeah, if they have yeah. any if they start wondering anything they ask Alexa and like they have an answer immediately. You know like yeah. how how many stars and how many blades of grass and anything that looks big and feels big they can find uh they can find words for and so yeah. but but also it feels like it could be a jumping off point for even deeper wondering. So I I just am curious if you if you feel like our relationship to this emotion is changing it it it's it's the best and worst times for awe you know <laughs> and i thought about this throughout the book the best times of awe are that a young person out there today or one of us can hop online and experience the world's music we can experience the best ideas in any domain from you know political thinking to spirituality we can learn new scientific findings we can learn about the brain. We can learn about genes, you know, um, and in some sense, um, you know, when I look at young people today, compare, you know, you just compare it to like, imagine a thousand years ago in the dark ages, people are dying, plagues, et cetera. It's a great time yeah. for all. At the same time, there are these forces working against it, the climate crises, clearly, you know, young people feel climate dread. And then what you pointed to, Aubrey, which is, um, you know, the digital technologies, uh, regrettably, have been designed against awe. You know, a Google yeah. search moves you right to an answer instead of, like, <laughs> making you wonder about things. Yeah. Uh, my favorite is Google Maps, right, which is it, it gives you the most efficient route to something and it denies all the discoveries. Mm -hmm. I was in Amsterdam this summer with it for working with a collaborator. And I was in one part of the city, I was getting to the university and I'd type into Google Maps. What's the, you know, how do I get to the university? It was the fastest route, but it sent me through all the drug and pornography areas of the city. I don't like drugs. I don't like pornography. It was like disgusting. I'm like, come on, you know, let me wander. <laughs> so, yeah. so we got a lot of pressures on awe, but I'm very, you know, one of the great things about the conversations around this book is it's opening up. I just a broader conversation about how do we embrace mystery? How do we let our kids wander? How do we get them to be curious about things we don't know that you can't ever answer on a test? Uh, and, and I think we'll, we'll move more in that direction. Yeah, that's interesting. It does seem like as like millennial parents, which is what we are, um, that we do sort of live in an age of anxiety where God. we don't, we, we are so afraid of anything happening to our children that we don't let anything happen to our children. I know you've collaborated with, <laughs> with, with Jonathan Haidt, you know, and this, yeah. is one of his, this is one of his big initiatives, you yeah. know, is to sort of like let kids, let kids grow. And I hadn't thought about it in those terms, but not just, yeah. not are you letting them sort of just like be able to interact with the world, but you're letting them experience mystery and awe yeah. when you, when you loosen that grasp a little bit. Yeah, no, you know, and man, I'm older than you guys. And my childhood was so filled with wandering and mystery and, you know, and it got a little dangerous at times. Yeah. I jumped into a river off rocks that I shouldn't have done. Uh, <laughs> you know, seriously, people died in that river routinely, oh, the wow. Yuba River. Wow. But, but it, it gave me the sense of spirit and the sense of who I am, right? Yeah. And the sense of purpose. So, yeah, I think, you know, what, what I'm really proud of is we have uh, a curricula that uh, through the Greater Good Science Center for teachers that will reach tens of thousands of teachers. It's like build awe back into your classroom. And it was based on an essay that the great environmentalist, Rachel Carson, one of my heroes wrote, how to teach your child to wonder. You know, she says wondering and awe are the antidotes to the staleness of civilization. And here's what you do. You let your kids get, you let them scrape their knees. You let them get wet. Mm -hmm. Then maybe they'll get a cold if they go out in a storm. Oh, God forbid, you know. Yeah, right. uh, maybe they'll get lost. Oh, my God, you know. Um, and and let, them, let them follow their spirit in the great American tradition. Uh, and I think, 
I think we'll make progress on that in this next, thanks to you guys, like this next generation of parenting, get out of this helicopter overscheduled nonsense. Yeah. Yes. We've yeah. Been, yeah. We've been sort of dancing. Sorry, Aubrey, were you going to no, go ahead, say go ahead. something? Um, we've been sort of like dancing around several different ideas about how yeah. one can experience awe. You, in the book, you call them the eight wonders of everyday life, I think. Yeah. Maybe, could you give us just sort of like, I think there are a couple that we really want to dive into a little bit more, okay. but could you just give us a brief overview of what those are? Yeah, thank you, Tim. Fundamental, right? Awe is the feeling you have when you encounter a vast mystery. It has all these things we can measure from words to goosebumps to patterns of brain activation to the vagus nerve. But in many ways, philosophers would tell us the key to an emotion is what's called its intentional object. What is it about, right? What is, what is the context in which you feel awe? What's your consciousness focusing on? And, you know, by gathering stories of awe from 26 cultures, we then took two years to code what was going on. What was the emotion about? And I call them the eight wonders of life. And they're, they're a great roadmap for finding awe. Moral beauty, the kindness and sacrifice and courage of other people. Nature, obvious, right? Uh, collective movement. You're in church and you're doing a ritualized chanting or singing or, you know, or a, a sacred gesture or a kneeling. Uh, then we get to the cultural stuff, which is visual design, art, buildings, etc., music, and spirituality, in particular, like deep contemplative practice. Finally, the two oddballs are, if you will, which are big ideas. When I teach awe, uh, you know, and this was less common, but big ideas totally freak some people out and they become awestruck. And, you know, I was giving a talk the other day, they like, anybody have an example of awe from big ideas? And this guy rose his hand, this woman raised her hand. She, she was like, dark matter. We're all dark matter. We're not, you know, she was like going on and on. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're also physical beings, but I understand, you know, dark matter is pretty cool. And then, you know, this one really knocked me out, which is the life and death cycle. It's a fundamental process in all of human existence is from life to death. You know, everything goes through this cycle and we feel awe about it. You know, when things begin, when babies are born and then when people pass and things end, like watching my brother die. Um, so those are the eight wonders and they're a great roadmap for us to be like, where can I find this? How can I bolster my sense of awe? Yes. The one that surprised me most, I think was that big, the big ideas, epiphanies. Yeah. And I, but I immediately What's your big recognized idea, it. Aubrey? Well, I was going to say, actually, I, my sisters and I have always called these truth tears. And a lot of times it's in a conversation mm. where somebody says something and it just like, you feel it, you, mm. you just, you feel it wrapping up all of these ideas that you've had and like coalescing it into something something so distilled and true and I like I it makes me cry and I've never been able mm. to understand why I'm having that reaction I'm not like particularly sad or happy but I, this this was this was a big idea like this is awe like I'm experiencing awe because someone has just illuminated this system that I've been unaware of but I can exactly it's it is completely true and I and I know it and then I and then we have to edit the podcast because like I'm crying and <laughs> we gotta like pull it together <laughs> but I thought that was so interesting and, Good. and I think that the thing that was so exciting about this list is that it's so accessible. It just feels like you don't, yeah. you don't have to, this isn't a thing you do in therapy or that you have to go far away for. It's, it's so it's, it's in your house. It's in your mind. It's like, it's wherever you want it to be. And there are so many mm. different moods you could be in to access awe instantly. Mm. And, and you talk about how important these frequent experiences with awe really, really are. Yeah. And, and so I wonder if you could mm. just I, you've mentioned a few, but what are some of the benefits of just having this experience more often? Man, you know, uh, and I love your truth tears. Theologians used to call them tears of grace when you understand mm -hmm. this, is, this is what God has touched, right? Or some spiritual force has touched in my life, unifying all, a variety of disparate ideas or possibilities. Um, yeah, you know, it was so interesting, Aubrey, because um, I started to write this book uh, when my brother passed and I took about 20 days by myself and I was just reading all the texts that really matter to me. I just started writing, uh, and I was really struggling and I realized like, God, I'm writing this book about this emotion that like you said, Aubrey, we can find anywhere, truly anywhere, eight wonders and beyond. And I, and, and not only that, but it's about as good for you as anything you can do. Right. So moments of awe reduce stress 
They give you a sense of community. They make you humble. They make your nagging voice of the self or ego vanish. They are good for your heart by activating the vagus nerve. They reduce inflammation in the body, which is this immune system response. It heats up the body. It's very bad for you if it's chronically activated. They give you a sense of meaning. They make you do things that are better for the environment. They make you moments of off, allow you to share and sense your deep community with fellow human beings and other species. I was like, man, if I'm really struggling, what I got to go do is find off, right? And, and that is part of the narrative of the book. It's like, you know, listen to music I don't understand, talk to spiritual leaders, et cetera. Um, and, you know, I, you know, one of the real exciting developments out of this book is like, people are starting to take seriously this idea that this is a fundamental pathway to health, it's, any kind of health. It's like, find off, find it in meditation, find it in spiritual practice, go find it looking at a sunset, find it at a sporting event. Um, and I believe it. And I think we'll see in the next 10 years, all interventions in hospitals, all interventions in therapy, um, and then the pretty robust health benefits to this emotion, which I felt viscerally in pursuing it for the book. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if we could talk a little bit more about awe as it relates to the religious experience. Yeah. I, and just to give you like a little bit of insight into the LDS Mormon tradition, mm. um, we have this, we have this term that we, we call feeling the spirit. So yeah. like there's this there's this entity you know the holy the holy spirit and when we when we in our tradition say we we feel the spirit we're um we're talking about some sort of like transcendental feeling and often I think we correlate it with this you know with this supernatural being you know, the holy yeah. spirit that's uh sort of relating some deep truth to us or comforting us in some way or helping us feel a greater sense of love and often this feeling comes during shared experiences in you know at in a religious rit ritual at a church meeting uh, you know, singing a singing a hymn or experiencing some some type of music, mm. or just feeling connected to the people in your community that you're that you're sitting next to in the pews. And I think one thing, and I I, I think we're actually talking about with a different vocabulary. I actually think we're talking about the same thing. Very much. So. Um, and one one part that gets tricky though potentially yeah. is like you describe in your book this sort of like scientific understanding of awe. You know, yep. there. There's there are things chemically that are that are happening in our bodies when we feel when we feel awe, and I think for people, especially those that are starting to uh, embrace science or maybe, um, and this you know I'm describing myself over the past 15 years, but that are um, you know in some sense deconstructing older religious paradigms, it can be scary to say, oh well, there's this there's a scientific explanation for this this deep feeling that I've had during my religious experiences. And in some way, it seems like if you take the supernatural out of it, yep. um, then it loses its meaning. It loses I agree. its transcendence. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Uh, totally. And so, like, how can a how can a religious person <laughs> think about think about this? I my my sense is like as I've um, evolved in my own in my own thinking and and faith, like that there there must be a way in which both things can be true. That there's a non dualistic answer here. But I'm curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, you know. Uh, and in some sense, writing the book led me to your position of, you know, um, there are things that are beyond science, you know, that, um, that are miraculous and real and, um, and essential to the human condition. Um, yeah, you know, in, in the book, I'm a scientist. I, I did not grow up in a religious context at all. Uh, I did grow up for part of my life around very vital and vibrant Mormon communities whom I admired. Best friend was a Mormon, one of my best friends. Um, and really admired the, the community feel. Um, the, the science of spiritual experience, and this is, you know, in large part, William James, Varieties of Religious Experience. He said that there's, it really is, as you were saying, Tim, like this, this spirit feeling, um, it is grounded in feeling. And I think it is this constellation of self-transcendent emotions of ecstasy and bliss and love and agape and awe, right? Where we're just feeling like we're encountering the divine. 81, 85% of Americans feel that. Um, and it's a real part of their lives. The scientific explanation is one, you know, and I chart that. And I am blown away by it, that 
It affects your body. It changes your brain chemistry, these spiritual experiences. It's good for your long-term life expectancy. Uh, it becomes the collective properties of this experience, like you referred to, through ritual, music, singing, eye-to-eye -eye contact, being together are transcendent. Um, you know, uh, your brain start to synchronize, your body start to synchronize. You become a collective organism. That astounds me. Mm. Uh, and in ways that we it. can measure. Yeah, you can measure that. Um, and so as a scientist, I get goosebumps thinking about what religions do. It's like, look at that. This is uh, just as a, a joke, like for me to get my class to all think about the same thing of 500 people at Berkeley is impossible. But if I go through rituals and we stand together and we vocalize words together and we do synchronized behaviors, we're all one. That's amazing. But, you know, and, and the world divides in, in science, which is there are the people who feel it reduces to just all biological things. Uh, and then there are the people who think that, that the neurons and cells in our body can't account for our consciousness. And I became part of that latter camp that there is this other realm of understanding and, and human experience that is beyond scientific explanation and physiology that's in, you know, and we just don't know. It could be a quantum physical world, right, of uh, different dimensions of time and space and connection and entities like the divine. It could be a spiritual world. Um, and, you know, for me, I came to that through you know, when my brother passed and he was with me after, I heard his voice in the wind, I felt his hand on my back. I still feel him around me in this transcendent way. That it, and, and that to me is, I hope, where both the really religious people can land, which is, isn't it amazing what science can tell us about this experience, this collective religious experience? And scientists need to land there too, right? Which is, there are so many dimensions to our lives that we will never put into a scientific study. And one of them is the spiritual. And, yeah. and uh, so I, I hope, and it's been interesting. The book has had a lot of play in different religious communities for just that reason. I like that. Here's a way in which we can all talk about this incredible experience we have with spirituality. And I love that it gave ritual this new this new meaning for me like you know sometimes you do the same thing over and over and every week and it's hard to keep infusing that with meaning but when you when you when you pause and think like what if I'm missing the point entirely and what if it really is about being one with this community and experiencing awe you know however often we're we're doing it and that was, it was like very exciting like that was built into this into this religious framework and in and I've never appreciated these benefits that I've, you know, that we're having throughout our, our life and throughout every age. Um, but I wondered if, like, are there ways that religions can also create obstacles to awe? Because oh, at yeah. the same time, we talk about certainty, like that's our goal, not, not awe necessarily, but we're going to solve the, the mysteries and, and we're going to have the answers and we're going to know, we're going to know what may be mysterious to, to somebody else. And, and so I, I, it feels like sort of this paradox, like where you can, you can, yeah. maybe you're experiencing both in a, in a single Sunday, but I, I don't know. I wondered if you had seen that. Yeah. And you know, this is a serious question for religions to be entertaining in the United States. Uh, there's a book out, the de -church, de churching of the United States and yeah. the rates of attendance at church are dropping dramatically. Um, I don't know about LDS communities. I bet they're more robust in some sense, but you know, a lot of churches, it's almost an existential threat. And the younger yeah. generation, the 20 to 40 year old category, which you guys are in, is just, it's just moving away from church. And, and I think there's this consensus that part of what's been lost is the, what we've been talking about here, which mm -hmm. is the power of feeling, you know, the power of ritual, the power of dynamic ritual, um, and the power, and, and it's moved to kind of low level politicizing, you know, away from what brings us together in community and through song and, and sacred texts and rituals and being together and immersion in nature and, and service work, frankly. Uh, you know, you think about these, these crystal churches in Southern California that are just capitalist entities. That's not, that's the antithesis of the spiritual feeling in some sense. So, yeah, I think that, I think, 
you know, um, I think that the, what churches do, um, you know, in reading the scholarship, if, if things become too hierarchical, uh, if it's not dynamic, uh, you lose awe. If it becomes about commodification and commerce, you lose awe. Mm -hmm. Any experience like that, the art world and the music world, the minute it becomes overly commodified, you lose the sense of, 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 of the awe potential in those domains. Um, and then, you know, I would pay careful attention to what you cited, Aubrey, which is ritual, which is rituals have to be, and the Mormon community, when I grew up around the Mormons, uh, it was a very robust community where I grew up. The rituals, I admired the dinnertime ritual, which mm -hmm. is sacred, and the ritualized moments in the seasons and, and the like, and the campouts. I was like, wow, they've met. Oh, so you, you yeah, got to stay ritual close too. to the, yeah, you got to stay close to the rituals and make it part of the intentional practice. And by the way, as somebody who's not religious in writing this, I'm like, I got rituals all around me. You know, I go to yoga Tuesday, Thursday. That's a ritual. You know, I look at people like we're a community, you know. So so I, I think it's yeah. awe is a good framework for keeping religions alive uh, for those who yeah. are committed to that. Yeah. And I think you you mentioned this in passing, but the the um, default mode frame or default mode network, is that what yeah. it's called? Where this this de-emphasis of self, it feels like it religions are so ripe to to sort of heal the polarization that we're experiencing and, and can't get a handle on. And I, I love that, like, it's such a proactive approach, like do awe and this thing takes care of itself in, in such a powerful way. Yeah. And, and churches seem like they they could be the the organizations that are leading that. They could. And, and but, you know, it's ironic to think about certain forms of Christianity that become so self-focused, like this is all about you as an individual having a purpose driven life and, you know, rising in your materialistic aspirations. To me, that's the antithesis of the, the spiritual sentiment or feeling. Uh, I, I see you guys nodding your heads. And, you know, certain religious communities, LDS being one, have always said it's community, you know family community, uh, larger community. And I think that's core. Yeah. yeah. Could we, yeah, I'd love to dive in that a little on that a little, just a little bit more because yeah. I was thinking about like, as I read, what, what's the goal of awe? What are we really trying to get at? I guess it, at times in my life, I've thought, okay, my goal is to be happy. That's what, yeah. that's, that's what I want out of this life. And then, you know, at, at some, in some points that started to feel a little, a little me focused, Great. selfish. There must be something, there must be something deeper going on here. And so what are, if if we let's say get into an intentional practice of establishing yeah. awe in our lives? What are we what are we actually trying to get at? Yeah, I mean that's the you know when we think about phenomena like awe or any music or art or religion, a social scientist, social biological scientist would say, what's the function? Like what's its deep purpose that that culture creates around and mm -hmm. evolution and so forth? And I think it really is two things, um, and Aubrey caught first the first one in her tears of truth truth tears which is you know the human mind one of our signature achievements is to see systems and a systems understanding of the world oh i'm part of a religious system or i'm part of an ecosystem or i'm part of uh, a political system or oh my matter comes from the big bang i'm part of this uh physical system that's the minute you get that you understand a lot about how things work and all gives that to you um, moments of awe make us feel like I'm part of a community, a social system, an ecosystem, a value moral system. And boy, do our young people need that today. Um, and then the second is community. You know, we are a hyper social species. We do everything collectively that matters. We've lost that in the West. Uh, you know, LDS communities are probably different than how most of us feel. There's so much loneliness out there. 40% um, of Americans feel lonely. Awe brings you community. So, wow, what two great gifts of awe, which is I feel community and connected and I see the world in this more holistic way and find my place in it. Um, so those are the two things I think awe brings to us. Love that. There was this really powerful part of the book that I loved where you, um, you're talking with Reverend Jennifer Bailey. Yeah. And she has this metaphor of compost. She, she talks about composting religion and I, I just have not stopped thinking about that because yeah. I, I think that's been an experience for us. This 
this you you notice this pattern of decay and distilling and growth and and so i but my, i guess my question for you is that you know as you go through that cycle of things breaking down and and yeah. there you talk about bacteria and worms breaking down what's toxic you're consuming what's toxic and creating this humus that is actually good for growth but i feel like when you're in your the part of your life or your faith life where yeah. thing, you're in that decay stage and things are breaking yeah. down, it's so hard to see what's really happening. It just feels yeah. broken. And so I wonder if, if you could just talk about how you find awe in that really difficult, really destabilizing, dark part of life. Yeah. And it, it's, it's, you know, Reverend Jennifer Bailey, one of the most inspiring people I got to speak with, uh, you know, and the people I interviewed for the book, provided such deep insights into awe, you know, Yumi Kendall, a cellist saying, music feels like a cashmere blanket of sound. I was just like, oh, that's it, you know? <laughs> and then Reverend Jennifer Bailey, I was talking to her and, you know, and she just said, well, you know, religion's always composting. And I was like, oh my God. And I read up on the science of composting and you nicely described it, Aubrey. And, and I think that, you know, the Western mind that, that really has shaped all of us really likes fixed entities and essences. But I believe the fundamental truth of life is it's always changing, you know? And other contemplative traditions, East Asian traditions, and their emphasis on impermanence are better at that, right? And so, you know, what that tells us, tells us is that just as we've been talking about, we have to embrace mystery. We have to live with uncertainty and being destabilized in our core belief systems, if it's about divinity or God or our relation to God. And we have to actively, um, you know, follow awe and the mystery and sense the, the evolution of our core convictions, our sense of faith or beliefs. And we'll arrive at new forms of conviction. You know, that happened with me. I, you know, when my brother passed, I was like, I can't imagine life without him. I don't even know what, uh, I would believe about the world and through just sitting with the, the hard uncertainty and the, the difficulties and the anxiety trauma, it got me to a deeper understanding of my life. Um, and there's now a movement very akin to what you're talking about, Aubrey, of like, awe is a pathway during trauma. Veterans coming back from combat, awe helps them evolve and find the composting of the traumas that they experienced in service. And the same is going to be true with religious. That's in some sense, the history, the evolution of religion is it's always evolving and changing through this, this complex process of composting. Oh my gosh. That's so beautiful. When you, when you feel the, when you feel anxiety creeping up because there, there's, there's uncertainty, you can always choose leaning into awe as opposed to being safe. There yeah, is definitely yeah. this impulse where I can hunker down and re retrench and not look around. And I, I love that you can trust that growth is always on on the other side of awe. And what a what a beautiful and and simple way to see the world. Thank you. Go I ahead. was just gonna ask if you in your research explored or found anything about the question, is is there is there such a thing as too much awe? You bring up in the yeah. book this concept of hedonic <laughs> adaptation. You know, it's like, I love tres leches. That's like my favorite dessert, but I wouldn't want to eat it for every single meal. You know, at some point it would become hell. You yeah. know, so how do we, um, how do we think about this? Like, is there a balance or is it just get all the awe you can get? Well, you know, awe is interesting because it doesn't seem to follow the law of hedonic adaptation. Yeah. And, it, you know, that the things that make us feel awe, our sense of the divine, the music that brings tears to our eyes. Uh, for me, a scientific understanding of the cells of the body. And um, they're always full of mystery, you know, and they always move us forward. We don't tire of them. And I think the best example of this is, you know, what you might call aficionados, people who love a certain realm of knowledge. They can't get enough. You know, they're just like, yeah. if they love crossword puzzles or you know, birding or wines or, you know, hieroglyphics. They're just always trying to awe moves them forward. So awe is, is really unique in the human realm. But yeah, you know, Tim, I mean, any, any human character strength like awe, you put into a continuum. There are people who have too little, they're depressed and anxious. 
There are people who have too much, you know, the two to 3% of a population and they're probably uh, manic, you know, and just like everything's oh, wow. amazing. Uh, and, and we got to watch that, but this is a, an emotion that pretty safely we can go in pursuit of and need more. And we probably need to wrap up, but if you were just, you know, what would you tell the audience? Like how, how would, how, how would you like to see people finding awe? Is this a daily practice of yours or, yeah. or something you think about, you know, when it arises spontaneously or, you know, what would you like to see people do? Yeah. You know, I mean, I think that there are two general recommendations and then hopefully read the book. One is what yeah. Tim alluded to earlier, which is those eight wonders of life. I mean, that's so much of human meaning is, and just to seek awe in those wonders, be it your spiritual practice, right? Go after something that's a mystery to you. If you're listening to music, don't just listen to music, you know, passively. Think them for a moment and go, oh, this is, this is a piece of music that uh, makes me cry. Why is that? Um, moral beauty. You know, people are remarkable. Think of a moment when someone uh, changed your life through an act of sacrifice or mentorship. Um, those are all practices that you can do. If you go to our podcast, Science of Happiness, we profiled some of them. So use the eight wonders. And then the second thing, Aubrey, is, you know, we just published a paper validating uh, a one minute exercise that produces an awe mindset, no matter where you are, right? I've done this with prisoners in prisons, which is, you know, you just, you slow down, put away your devices, take a few deep breaths. Don't try to name the thing. Don't try to label it. And just think for a moment about something vast that's mysterious for you, right? And around you in your immediate life context. When people do that, our studies show you do it once a day for a minute. And these are healthcare providers during the pandemic. They show radical decreases in, in depression and anxiety as they were helping people get through COVID. So find the awe mindset, right? Find the, think about the eight wonders, then just slow down, take a moment, think about what's vast around you. It could be the eyes of a bunch of people you see or the sky or the sound of a rain storm um, and you'll find it and then cultivate the practice. Um, so lots to do. And, yeah. One thing, just as a very quick follow-up, one thing I've noticed and appreciated about you, Dakar, is that you seem to be very conscious of your own experience of awe. Listening to you in, in this conversation, others that we've heard, you, you, yeah. you'll call out like, oh, that gave me goosebumps. Like, oh, I'm feeling, I'm feeling <laughs> this. Um, I'm, I, I'm curious if that, if that awareness of awe well, I imagine that it's developed over time, but if it, yeah. if it in any way has augmented your, your experience of awe. It has profoundly. So I just got goosebumps with your question. I'm embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's important to remember, I, and I write about this in the book, like I, I was kind of a grouchy kid. I was sort of anxious by temperament, you know, obsessive. Awe changed my life. And, and it's back to a point that we made earlier, which is. I, I think this is, as Einstein said, this is a basic state of the mind, right? Mm -hmm. It is a basic state of consciousness for people in spiritual traditions, like the LDS community and the feeling that you talked about, Tim, tears of truth that Aubrey mentioned, you want to move towards this in your spiritual practice, right? For the nat, the naturalists that I studied, you know, who are backpackers, rock climbers, they get to it through, you know, extreme sport for the musicians. It's this moment in music. It's a basic state of consciousness. And our challenge is to find our roadmap and, and find it on a daily basis. And for me, writing the book, everybody always asks, like, did you, do you no longer feel awe? And I was like, are you kidding me? It's, I felt awe like six times in our conversation the, based on what you guys revealed to me with tears. I'm like, wow, you know, um, so. So it's, oh. but it's important to have it there as something that, that's an intention of the work we do in life. Thank you so much. This, this book and your work has already had such a, a positive influence on our own life personally. And 
um, we're just, we feel a lot of gratitude to you personally. So thank you. And thanks for the interview. This is amazing. It's really, it's really incredible that the work that you're spreading with the world. I think this is, there's very, there's very little, if anything, that's more important, I think, than this right now. Mm. Thank you, Tim. And thank you, Aubrey. It's, uh, it's been a real honor for me, um, to engage with spiritual communities, you know, mm. through awe. Um, I wasn't raised in a religious context as I write about in the book, but it means a lot to me. Um, and has given me spirit. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. All right. Thanks so much for listening. We really hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Dacker Keltner. His book, Awe, The New Science of Everyday Wonder and How It Can Transform Your Life is available on Amazon or wherever books are sold. And if Faith Matters content is resonating with you and you get the chance, we would love for you to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you listen on. We read all of the reviews and it really does help us to get the word out about Faith Matters. We appreciate the support. Thanks again for listening, and remember you can check out more at faithmatters.org.